Concept Crucible, episode 5. That's always staying in. Ah, uh, yeah, might as well. Anyway, hi everybody, how you doing? I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And as he mentioned, this is Concept Crucible Podcast, episode 5. We have made it this far. We have. We are to, and today we want to talk about um, inspiration and how inspiration relates to art, specifically to us, because mm -hmm. we're not really authorities on inspiration generally. Or art. Or art. Though we will get Dan on at some point to talk about art. Yeah. I'm slowly shoving Dan into the notion of making videos again. We'll just tell him that it's we record it for posterity. No, I'll just all... kidnap his paintings and leave them here. Oh, no. He'll, that, have, okay, he'll yeah. have to come for those. That'll work then. But, um, yeah, I mean, inspiration, especially with uh, websites like Uproxx and Up, Up, where the inspiration is a booming business. Yeah. Sadly. But there are still lots of things out there that, are, that I think are inspiring. Um, but there's that question of, of what, it, what, it, what does it mean to be inspired or what constitutes inspiration? And that, I think, is our icebreaker this week. Okay. Do you want me to start? Do you yeah, want to start? Yeah, you can start. I just introduced it. I always introduce the icebreaker. <laughs> so, uh, what is inspiration? Um, for me, it tends to be more... Uh, I almost equate, or uh, it's a synonym for me, with inspiration and uh, emotion and uh, evocation or evocative. I don't even mm -hmm. know if evocations are the right word, but because if you're throwing fireballs, it could be. That was last podcast, by the way. Yeah, it's true. Um, so for me, mine is ultimately bound up in uh, feelings or the the feelings that you get from something. So when I listen to a piece of music and it, it creates certain kind of emotions within me, and not an emotions necessarily in the classic sense of like happy or sad or whatever, just the mm -hmm. feeling of some sort of impetus uh, or the feeling that something could be accomplished. So when I, uh, we talked about this before, uh, when I was running, which yep. you can't tell in the screen, but I am a, a large, large man. Um, the, the only reason I, I'm even slightly taller than Ryan is because I am mostly torso. Yeah, and I'm hunched over, so... But anyways, I am a large man, and at one point I was consistently running around campus for fitness purposes mostly it was to cultivate shin splints but uh i had the goal of losing weight and but it's really hard to motivate myself to run because running is not intrinsic it's not intrinsically motivating enough to overcome laziness apathy and pain so i needed something that was the extra boost and i needed something to to help propel me forward uh, so, you know, you have your pregame ritual, but when I was running, I would listen to, uh, I'd have a set list of six songs, and the first one that always kicked it off was uh, Ecstasy or Ecstasies of Gold, um, the version done during the Symphony of Metallica concert, because there's the okay. original one done by... Um, I was going to guess Rocket Skins. No, 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 it was uh, the, the composer, it was from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, at Ennio, I think Ennio was the last name. I can't remember the composer's name off the top it's in of my the show head. Notes. I will throw it in the show notes. Uh, but anyway, so Michael came in with the S uh, San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, uh, redid it, and uh, it it's always played as Metallica's opening piece. So before <laughs> they hit the stage, that's their their uh, live or their their intro piece. So the symphony plays the Ecstasies of Gold, and it's just this wonderful. It builds up from a nice slow piece, and then eventually it takes off into this soaring piece, and there's wonderful. Um, kind of march-like uh, snare drums in there mixed in with the violins and it just swells and swells and swells until eventually Metallica takes over but when I was running that was the piece that I always started running to so I would do my stretches go to the starting line for where I started the run and as soon as I was ready to go I'd hit start on the, the mp3 player and I would start my run and that's what kind of built me up and got me going uh to at the start of the run and that would propel me forward you know for the 5k it started off and then six songs later i would be done my run nice. um so yeah for me inspiration tends to be uh it brings up these the kind of emotional impulse yeah um, and specifically sort of with music i remember you were talking about um you saw pixar the, mm -hmm. the symphony recently right yeah so uh recently the the local symphony had a one night performance of pixar pieces uh and it was it was amazing i the, the only other time i went to the symphony here in town and i regret not going more often but the last time was the john williams one where they played the music from john williams's different movies or the movies that he's been involved with so they played uh i didn't look at the 
how many movies Pixar has made, but I'm pretty sure they've ma- they did music from all of the Pixar movies, nice. uh, from Toy Story one all the way through to Brave and Toy Story three and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found myself because they they not not only did they play the music, but they also had a giant screen in the back where they cut a bunch of clips together from the movie and then played the video of it, not the audio, but they played the video of it. So essentially the the orchestra was playing a live music video yeah. in some sense. Wow. And it, it was it was amazing. And it was amazing to watch the conductor orchestrate it because that all had to be timed together for the beats and whatnot. And I remember on even movies that I had never seen, I for example, I've never seen Ratatouille. Um, and I hear it's an amazing movie. I've never seen it, but between the images on the screen and the music that they were playing, I felt these swells of emotion within me. Like the music really moved me. Um, and having never known what the story was, I mean, I can guess it. I know. Yeah, Cause I was thinking about it for me. Um, for me, inspiration is much more performative. It's much more creative. Um, I, um, I don't know. I, I, I'm a person who feels pretty strong emotions normally, but so for me, I have to be making stuff, mm-hmm. and I, br- I brought up Pixar partly because when I go to the symphony, um, I forget the last thing I saw was, I think it was the U2 night, um, but uh, I always have to bring a notebook because I am insp- like, I'm, I'm writing things down, I'm designing dungeons, I'm, you know, writing poetry, I'm freestyle, ra- like just anything and, and everything. Um, when I am inspired is when I when I what I categorize as inspiration is things that inspire me to create other things or to take actions. I mean, people whose work is inspiring might inspire me to be less of a jerk or be you know more of a jerk. Sometimes <laughs> probably not more of a jerk. Although younger Jim was certainly inspired by that sometimes, poorly so. I modeled myself after House well, at one time. I binged to watch the entire the entire that seems house. problematic and yeah i definitely modeled myself after house. are you in fact a genius home team doctor oh well, i pretend to be um i'm not mm-hmm. <laughs> but i definitely walk around acting superior or at least i did at the time i still do i imagine <laughs> but i definitely walk around with a superiority chip on my shoulder yeah so for me like i i have to be making something and often I'm, I'm not in, I'm not sort of inspired in that way by music. Um, for me, it's, it's usually visual or, um, action really like film, mm. like something that's, that's, that's film, I guess is visual, but it's also auditory. It's, it's, it's a lot of, it's, a, it's, it's complicated. Mm. Making film and video is complicated. If you were wondering, yeah, this is pretty hard, mm. but that's, I guess my short answer for it. My long answer is significantly longer, but we don't have time for that. So, I mean, part of the question is, is what works ex- inspire us specifically? We wanted to talk about that in terms of art, in terms of music, in terms of uh, film. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that hit me, Shia LaBeouf right now, by the time this podcast comes out, this will probably be over. Because I assume he's not going to do it for three months. But Shia LaBeouf right now is doing an art piece called I'm Sorry. And it's it's a piece, ironically, given that it's Shia LaBeouf and he's had problems with plagiarism in the past, it is a piece that is not unlike a bunch of other pieces. I'm not saying it's plagiarism because I don't know enough about the piece or the other people's pieces, but it's, it's certainly in the same vein of a lot of extreme vulnerability art pieces. The, the whole shebang is that Shia LaBeouf is sitting in a room in, in Los Angeles with a bag over his head and people can pay ten dollars and go in and do whatever they want. They can yell at it. Some of them yell at him. Some of them hold his hands. Some of them give him hugs. Some of them just, you know, sit there quietly. And it creates this moment of intense awkwardness and vulnerability. And lots of other artists have used this to great effect too. They 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 use it to make us see what we're capable of when faced with a helpless person or a person who is willing to be helpless. They use it to make us feel vulnerable because when we see someone in a condition of extreme vulnerability we feel open to that i mean you get a lot of the time when these are uh these are happening you know you get to see the sort of height of people's cruelty but you also get to see the sort of height of people's compassion Mm -hmm. and that is something that that inspires me it inspires me to make things it inspires me to 
act in a way that is different from how I normally act. Normally, I I, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about about vulnerability, and one of the things those kinds of pieces remind me of is that vulnerability is not a flaw. Vulnerability is a strength. Mm-hmm. I mean, the being willing and able to be vulnerable with people um, is 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 an act of courage and an act of trust. It is not an act of weakness, mm-hmm. um, though it is often perceived as an act of weakness, especially if you were a dude. Mm. Um, well, I, yeah. I, it's easy. It's easy to see why. I mean, vulnerability ultimately is the the courage comes from the willingness to lo- allow somebody's power to be uh, put upon you. Like it's well, I mean that the, the perception of the power imbalance. Meanwhile, you're the one who's allowing it. So ultimately, you're the one who has all the power. Because you're allowing it to happen to you, but I can see why it would be seen as, as a weakness. I suppose I, I, I hadn't thought about it in quite that way. Partly because, um, I think the the most important times to be vulnerable. Are when. I feel the least empowered. So I mean, I mean, an exa- a good example of this is uh, in romance. I mean, part of part of, uh, loving somebody is and 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 caring about them in that way is the willingness to be vulnerable and and giving it get you you afford them a certain power over you and you don't necessarily do so willingly and that i think is part of the the anxiety that that people get with it is that it, it's not willing mm-hmm. and i i don't i i, I should i should rephrase it i think I, I i phrased it badly when i said that the willingness to be vulnerable but to accept vulnerability mm-hmm. vulnerability is a thing that you have no matter what you're not necessarily letting your guard down mm-hmm. Um, so much as accepting that it is okay to you know the the the, the knowledge to, to 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 not allow the knowledge that someone could hurt you to get to you mm-hmm. so yeah it's I, it's it's and and i think that sort of better illustrates the the kind of power relationship i'm talking about because you're right when you talk about being invulnerable it's just or being vulnerable it's just a matter of Oh, I'm letting you do something, as opposed to you. You are empowered to do this thing, no matter what, and I am trusting you not to. Well, it could even go deeper. I'm, I'm, I can't help but to think about Epictetus uh, a little bit. But the idea, like vulnerability and the strength in vulnerability, is that it's, it's it, not a real kind of crucible podcast unless we talk about at least one dead Greek philosopher. <laughs> no, I guess it's true. Dead, dead pseudo white man because he's Mediterranean and. But but regardless, Anyways, no, that's yeah. not the point. Make the your point, point. Make your point. The, the point is is um, I wonder if there's uh, something in by by accepting vulnerability, you're actually setting the signal that really other people don't have any power over you, and that's something that Epictetus taught about. You know, you can you can mm-hmm. be a slave, uh, but the only time that the master has power over you is when you allow them to have power over you. And I mean, that was I don't know maybe if that like Nietzsche would talk about that as being like a slave morality that. You know, you just take your licks because you're weak and, you know, he might have something different to say about it. But like Epictetus was talking about the idea that and or, or just um, a more modern context of Eleanor Roosevelt. You know, the, o- the only people who can make you feel inferior are the ones that you allow to make you feel inferior. Kind of deal, I, don't right? know that, I don't know that I, I think modern psychology has more to say about it than about that kind of thing. But I'm an armchair psychologist. That. Yeah, that's the way it works. Cause I but my armchair uh, and I but yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's that's sort of my. The other thing I guess about about art is that you 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 can be inspired. You don't have to be inspired by real people. Mm. You can be inspired by fictional people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used the example earlier of, of um, there's a great bit in the Superman radio show, Superman and the, versus the Clan of the Burning Cross, which is Superman versus the KKK. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you not from the Americas, that's the Ku Klux Klan. They're a group of right white supremacists, and they're really bad people. Um, I feel no qualms, no qualms about saying that. But, um, and the, the part of the idea of having Superman fight the KKK in the radio show was that kids who grew up listening to the Superman radio show would understand that the KKK were not a force for good, that their values are at odds with Superman's. And Superman, as far as a moral compass goes, barring the last movie... A, he's, he's a pretty good authority on that kind of thing. I mean, if, if, if you're Superman's enemy, odds are good that you're falling on the sort of evilish side of the alignment tree. <laughs> to go, once again, back to our last podcast. But, I don't know, what about you? What kinds of art do you find inspiring? 
Uh, well, I guess it kind of depends on the context. So as I said, with um, when it came to running, a particular kind of driving music. Um, I also liken it when I was back in cadets that my favorite, uh, the, the my favorite thing to keep me going was the uh, military music, more specifically pipes and drums. But I, I like the driving beat of the drum, whether it was the bass drum or the the interesting snare drum and the snare fills. Uh, so that really worked for me. Um, at Pixar for for more evocative um feelings like for example in cars i don't know if i've ever watched cars all the way through you watch cars it's a really good movie uh that's what i hear and i think i've seen it about 30 times (laughs) that's what happens when you babysit right yes uh so i i think i've seen it all the way through before or it could be like et for the longest time i'd never seen et start to finish i always saw it in pieces and not necessarily in the right order um, so with cars, but at the symphony, I was watching it and there's the, the scene at the, where, within the last race where what's the, what's the protagonist's name? Lightning McQueen. Lightning McQueen. So when McQueen is getting ready to win the race and then he, he thinks back to his, what happened to his mentor and he stops short of winning, goes back down and, and helps it out. Basically, um, that is basically the best part of cars. Probably. And it's not exactly a novel thing. There are plenty of, uh, there are plenty of cases in the, in pop culture where, you know, like go and help your enemy or you go and help your your perceived uh, antagonist and you help them across and then everybody kind of wins because of that act of compassion but i remember again i watched it and i saw it stop and then whatever was happening in the music but between the music and then the, the visuals you know it, it was just it really kind of hit home like i had a lump in my throat of just this this wonderful act of self-sacrifice that you know ultimately wasn't about winning and it wasn't about um, being number one it was about something much more than that um, or another time or another thing that I really feel evocative about is uh, like real intense fights between like the forces of good and evil or between who's supposed to be the good guys and who's supposed to be the bad guys so um, Luke versus Vader part two and return of the Jedi this is where the, it's the music like it's I remember the first time that I paid attention to the music so right after Vader antagonizes Luke, uh, you know, like if I can't turn you to the dark side, then perhaps you, like, I'll be able to turn to your sister to the dark side. Yeah. And Luke lunges out at him, and it, and it has this wonderful shot where the camera is situated, you know, kind of like back under the stairs, under the platform. So all of the foreground is dark, and even all of basically Luke and Darth are dark, and then you have the blue of the background, and the camera does this really slow pan as they're fighting and Vader's being backed up and Luke is attacking him and the music swells and it's mostly uh mostly what you hear is uh, maybe the violins a little bit but it's mostly a chorus of just like ooh uh, you know the going back and forth on these whole notes but i just remember the first time i i, I got chills watching hmm. it just on the music alone and it just had this wonderful it was just so evocative like of this kind of heroic last stand because now i mean you could say what you want about luke but now he's no longer just fighting for the redemption of his father which is what he intended to do when he came there like now he's like fighting for his sister like if he doesn't win then not only will the emperor win but now he's gonna let his family down and in this case his sister right so it just it really hammered home and like i said the the for me the inspiration and uh, it really comes down to like these evocative feelings. So I always think of the how it should have ended, where where Vader's just like, "I have a daughter. I have a daughter. <laughs> this is amazing." Time to Stormtroopers. I have a daughter. <laughs> that there is so much right. We should we should definitely link to that if you haven't totally seen will. it. Uh, there is so much that they do that is awesome on yes. that, that channel with the, that video series. So, um, so because I'm Batman. Yeah. Uh, you should, uh, that, that go, should go and save Amy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Oh. Uh, so I guess I guess uh, I'm telling too many stories. Uh, so try to narrow it down. Uh, what works inspire me? Usually things that uh, for musically, usually it's uh, either stuff that's very. Um, I hesitate to use the word tribal, but very drum heavy, uh, okay. very percussive. And it seems like a much better way to phrase it than tribal. Well, because I well I like the tribal drums, but it's not just it's very percussive. I like percussive. It's the same. I I really like heavy metal, Mm -hmm. but I like the marriage between the brutalness of like metalcore, which some viewers or some listeners might think that metalcore is actually not very brutal at all. 
that's that's fine. But I like the the marriage between the brutality of metalcore with the heavy riffs and the the intense drumming, married with the melodic elements. So I like the soaring guitars. I like the wonderful like noodling guitar bits and vocals that soar over top of of whatever's going on with the instruments. So I like I like percussive. I like stuff that's driving, and I do like. <laughs> Not to be too sexual, but I like the the swelling side of the music when the when the music really the swells. Side. Yeah, the, the, just like I love it when music crescendos and when uh, the music pick up. Are you uh, are up. you avoiding using the word climax? Is that no? I don't like the climax. I like the build up. The climax is usually so boring. The, the climax is underwhelming. Is what <laughs> yeah, you're saying? I love it, is... it. I love it when the music swells or. Um, when when you hang a note uh, on the um, I don't have, it's been too long since I've been to music theory but there's a term for when you bring it up to like, eleven no not eleven no 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 I'm talking about like when you when you're playing a, a, a like say a chord progression or something and you end it on um, the only thing that comes to my mind is like seventh or ninth where it's you ha you hang it on a very unstable note and you sit there and you your mind wants to resolve it down back down into like the do uh, mm -hmm. or first position uh, or what the octave or whatever you it just sits there and you create this tension with the note and right before it resolves I like when it builds up to that and it slows down and you're waiting for the payoff you're waiting for it and then finally it comes and the music resolves I like that kind of stuff. Ironically, as the music making half of this duo, I spend way less time thinking about music than you do, apparently, because music is actually not high on my sort of list of stuff that inspires me. I mean, it can make me emotional, but it rarely inspires me to make stuff. Mm -hmm. um, usually, when I when I'm listening to music, I'm I'm visual art. On the other hand, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I just finished writing a song about uh, the picture that's behind Ryan Ryan's head that you can barely make out. Um, by this time, hopefully, I will have finished the song, and the song will be out. And if it is, I will link it. Right here, over his face. Um, and also in the show notes for those of you listening. But um, I've still got a lot of work to do on the lyrics. But like, for music to inspire me, music is sort of finished. Um, it never inspires me to make music. And it sometimes inspires me to make other things. But I get a lot of mine from, from visual art and from film. I don't watch a lot of movies anymore, but when I do, that's what I'm looking for, is that moment that just moves me to to change my behavior or moves me to make a thing or just uh, sometimes just moves me emotionally. I talk about this this scene in Mr. and Mrs. Smith that I have no idea why it affects me, but it does. And music, I guess, is the same way. I have yet to make it through a rendition of One Tin Soldier on my guitar without breaking down and crying, and I have no clue why that is. Mm -hmm. Like, none. I was, you know, but something, something in my, in my, in, it, it hits some moment in my past that is, that is clearly very important to me. Uh, but I have no, I have no real memory of what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, most, most of my stuff comes from, you know, visual art, like things that I can, I can build on. Music always seems finished to me. Um, whereas with visuals, there's always there's always some other story to tell. I mean, I, I, you look at the art behind me; it's all fragments of a thing that I could tell a story about, and that's and that's what I want in art is is that tiny little sliver. And every once in a while, I get something. I always think uh, a friend of mine, uh, Nick Heron, did this amazing painting of Victoria Park, and I will I will try and find the the link on his site and post it below because it is beautiful. And in general, you should check out Nick's work because it's amazing. Um, but he did this painting, and it hit me because I remembered standing in the spot where, from where he had taken the picture that he painted the painting from. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty abstract painting, but I could it, there was enough Victoria Park there that I could see it. And I had stood in that spot 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I first moved to this big, huge town that I didn't know anybody. Um, but at least we lived right near the park. And that was really exciting to me because I was five. Mm -hmm. And I was like, shit, yeah, park. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't get a lot from, from music. But I suppose we should move on. 
um, and talk about the, the, the takeaway from this. Why is it important to be inspired by art? I mean, lots of people are inspired by uh, the actions of other human beings. I mean, the internet has been great for that, that you can, you can find actions of compassion that are going on all around the world and it's easier to hear about them. And I think it is important to be inspired by them, but, but art specifically, things that other people have made, why is it important to be inspired by that? I know from, and I probably can only speak about myself here, uh, I know that I'm moderately okie dokie at getting stuff done. Um, I'm not, I'm not good at doing stuff even if I don't I want to see that on it. your next resume. Moderately okie dokie at getting well, things done. Well, I mean, my, the proof in the pudding for me is I, I ultimately got my thesis done. Fair enough. I mean, I it, it, it wasn't timely. It wasn't neat. But it got done. Like, it just, it was a brute force effort. And it, and it got done. It got bound up. It's hard copy and everything like that. So, I mean, I'm at least, at the very least on my like lifetime cv i can say i'm moderately okie dokie at getting stuff done that i don't want to get done on a lifetime cv that actually sounds pretty good to be yeah. fair but nevertheless i do recognize that there are times where i just cannot motivate myself to do something or i can't i can't really connect somehow uh, with something that i should i should be connecting with and I really do find that art, uh, whether it's music or video, because I've I've been inspired from all different kinds. I guess maybe mm -hmm. static, like visual art, uh, paintings and drawings and stuff. Slightly less inspiring. It's always when it's coupled with a story. So, for example, comic books. Uh, but the art in and of itself wasn't necessarily the most motivating part of it. Um, but, you know, when I want to feel courageous, um, I think of, you know, like, from my youth the ghostbusters you know and the, at the very end of the movie even though you know you knew it was going to turn out okay the idea that these four guys accepted the fact that they're probably not going to walk away from from their final act but it was the only thing that they could think of in order to save the city you know? i would think that no one walks away from their final act okay <laughs> touche touche i'll try to be cleaner with my words um I'm just being a banana castle no going. it's quite all right you caught me uh, but but that idea that there's a there's a heroic portrayal or a, a personal sacrifice, uh, it was also I got that feeling. I, I I don't really like war movies for the sake of war movies, but the final charge it always g it gives me a lump in my throat. Uh, whatever you think of Mel Gibson uh, in in the movie We Were Soldiers, the very last stand. So I'm not saying like anything against the Viet Cong or whatever. I'm not saying like America good, Viet Cong bad. But in that final portrayal, when he kind of looks around at everybody, pulls out his bayonet and gives the final order to fix bayonets, you, you get the sense that they didn't really know if they were coming out of that alive, uh, but they were going to go and make their last stand. You know, and, and I'm not saying that all heroic last stands are, are things to, to inspire people. I mean, Custer and his last stand and the massacres that went on. Like, we can't ignore the cultural context of those things, but um, you can maybe distill a little bit of like the personal side of it that, you know, some guy on the front line and, you know, the, 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 the courage needed to go and do these things. Or... Well, and there is, there is something exciting about, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's, I, I think it's a sort of fundamental property of mortality mm -hmm. that, you know, your life is the final thing you have to give. You know I mean? You're mm. Patrick Henry and you know, yeah. I, I regret that I have but one life to mm. give for my country. And, and the notion that you would value something uh, so highly that you would lay down the, the thing that you have only one of for mm. it. Um, you know, I mean, if, if you can always, you can, you can find new family, you can rebuild wealth, mm -hmm. you can, grow back arms and legs with the right science mm -hmm. we have the technology you know but but your life you only get one right so i guess to, to to try to tie it all up i sometimes i think it's inspired because there are times where you don't necessarily at that moment have it within you to do what needs to be done or be the person that you need to be and sometimes I feel that it's it's important to be able to, emotional crutch is the wrong word, but to be able to, to draw 
power to draw inspiration or courage from something else to to move you in that direction to be able to to do what needs to be done uh which is ultimately like i I, we talked about this a little bit before the show that i tend to really identify and get invested with characters i really enjoy well we talked a little bit about earlier with house but uh as you can tell i'm big on uh, on doctor who right now and i look at uh, Doctor Who as a possible moral exemplar. I mean, whatever you think of Stephen Moffat or Russell T. Davies or however you, you think about the politics around the show and how it's written and how the characters yeah. are treated. But the character of the Doctor. The character of the Doctor, whether old Who or new Who, there are qualities about him that... Um, or qualities about the character, because I'm even willing to say like there could be qualities of a female doctor that you just ultimately want to emulate. Uh, I hope you, there could you... be qualities about a female doctor. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, yeah, but you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. But you talked about it, like compassion. From me, I like the cleverness as well. But the idea of just somebody who is able to to do what is morally right or morally good, even if the story sometimes seems ambiguous about it, that the doctor is willing to do harm for the greater good. Uh, you know, like the fall of Gallifrey or even uh, the second episode of season five when he's willing to um, basically um, uh, kill the brain of a space whale in order to end its suffering. Yeah. You know, like it, 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 it sh- the doctor should have found a way to be able to, to do it without Amy, so to speak. But at that particular moment, based on what he had seen at that point, he was willing to end the suffering of this this creature that probably had no el- nobody else in the universe like it. Um, you know, he, he was going to make the wrong decision ultimately, according to the story. But um, still, like the character is, I think, something that you can still try to strive towards. So I, I think that's for me. That's why it's important is because I'm not perfect and I'm not always able to do what needs to be done. Sometimes I need a little bit of help, and I think art. Uh, you mentioned it earlier art is usually eternal and usually it's something that's always there you can always draw inspiration from it from so i think that's why it's important i i i mean i i, I agree with you for the most part although you are down you are you are sublimely a virtue ethicist <laughs> in that regard and i don't i don't model people the same way i think at the this the season closer of this <laughs> podcast will be the virtue ethics will episode be the, the virtue ethics. we're building towards it we're laying the groundwork <laughs> until eventually we have the f- epic finale two-part conclusion of virtue a virtue the virtue ethics slap where I, fight where i die but we run the the potential possibility that i will come back for season two <laughs> <laughs> but for me um i think you're right that art, art is permanent art is always there um and that and that's it for me too like i i i'm i draw a lot of strength from people around me my friends my family that kind of thing but they're not always accessible and they're not always accessible when i require strength um and so in those moments i can turn to art in those moments i can turn to um you know things that, and that, that i guess is 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 sound it sounds emotive and it sounds you know sort of emotional and it is sometimes but sometimes it's also performative like I, when i just need i need to make something you know whether whether it's whether it's you know i'm helping somebody move or you know i just i need to have a blog post for this week and i better think it's something because i need to have a blog post for this week but I'm not feeling creative, and I'm well. I and 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 when I when you're not feeling creative, there's that notion that you have never had a good idea mm-hmm. ever, and that all of all previous works have been a giant waste of time. Um, you know, and you're just you're just living in this hollow make work project. It really sucks. But grad in, school. Yeah, no. <laughs> in the in that moment. Um. That is that is when I, I I turn to art and I turn to music or film or or you know I have a lot of um, I call them fetishes they're sitting around my room you can see a couple of them up here just barely I've got my rock and uh, in some of the other videos you can see my mac and cheese and things like that and I just but I, I have these objects um, that aren't art they're just objects but the, the the art objects are slowly becoming more important because they can they can draw me out of my shell better. Mm-hmm. But I think if I were to sum up sort of yours and mine, I think, I think that is the, the point where we come together mm-hmm. is on why it's important. We, we have different definitions. We might be we inspired by entirely different things. Like you, you're really musical and I'm really uh, visual. Um, but if I were to sum it up in three words, 
it would be one more inch. I mean, that is that is what inspiration gives you. That is what whether whether it's an emotional inch, whether it's a, a performative inch. All in in that moment when all you really need is to go one inch further than you have. Um, art will help you get there. And it will move you get there and it will do so timelessly it will do so eternally you can be inspired by uh, works of art and literature from 3,000 years ago uh, you can be inspired by works of art and literature from yesterday but it will help you get that one inch further that you need and then you have just to go one inch beyond that mm -hmm. and further and, and and further this in fact is is a concept from a piece of art because um, I'm 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 cribbing it. I, I don't think directly, but pretty closely from V for Vendetta, mm -hmm. where they talked about exactly that. Uh, any given Sunday, I believe, also talked about it in terms of because it's a football movie. So oh yeah, yeah, everything's in inches there too. But I well, think it's, it's an, American football. What are you gonna do? True, true. But yeah, I think uh, I think it's a it's a really good way to look at it. That it's. Um, and I don't remember, I don't recall off the top of my head, but the, uh, where the reference comes from, but the idea of the muses, um, you know, even when you're down, the muses will sing to you to help you just go that much further. Uh, and ultimately like art and music and stuff are in some sense, the muses, you know, divinely created, so to speak, and, and brought down to, to give us a glimpse of the eternal, if you were going to go the platonic we're ranks. Gonna be, we're going to be mystics about it briefly. And we can be mystics briefly. I'm wearing a Power Rangers shirt after all. And it's the, our podcast. We can do whatever we want. So. Well, within reason. Yeah. But, um, so I guess our question for you is what inspires you? And, and share the things that inspire you below. Because the one great thing about being inspired by art is you can share it around and it isn't decreased by sharing. It is, in fact, improved. Mm -hmm. By sharing and people's improve experiences are improved by sharing. So, um, if you are listening to this off the post, um, we will I will include some some pictures and some some things that inspire me, and Ryan will include some that inspire him. Mm -hmm. um, just at the bottom. If you are not, go to the post where you will find them. If you are watching us, go there. In fact, it's the links right down here, and you'll get the full show notes and you will get some links of some cool stuff. But yeah, leave your comments because I would love to see them. And who knows, you might inspire other people through what uh, inspires you. I hope so. Oh. I mean, that's really, we, mutual inspiration is really what we're going for. It's like the best kind of circle jerk. Yeah. That's where we're going to leave it for this week, I think. We have just jumped some kind of shark. Yeah. Anyways, I'm Ryan. And I'm Jim. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast signing out. Stay awesome. <laughs>